Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Natasha Tsopardi Muscat, the Director for Country Health Systems and Policies in WHO Regional Office for Europe. Thank you very much for coming to our session. I hope that you had some coffee, but if you haven't had enough coffee, don't worry, we're going to make sure that we keep you awake because we have a very interesting session ahead of us, a session which is very much uh, um, keeping in motive. We have called it aligning the stars for access to novel medicines. Now, how many of you have ever seen the stars in one line? No, not yet. Not yet, yes, maybe. But this is what we are trying to do, no? Because it almost feels as though we're really trying to put a number of things that all have their own very set place, but we are trying to, to align them so that we can achieve our objectives, which are around improving access to novel medicines for all those who can benefit across the European region, but we would not stop there. We are starting in Europe because this is where our mandate lies. But of course, if we are successful, we hope and our ambitions are that we could even go beyond. And uh, to uh, moderate the session with me, which will be in two parts, I'd like to uh, also welcome and introduce Dr. Sarah Garner, who has been the technical um, focal point really leading what we call the Oslo Medicines Initiative. And we will start off with uh, um, uh, an introduction from our regional director. But let me first also um, apologize for uh, Dr. Bjorn Inge Larsen, former Secretary General from Norway, who was actually really the person behind this initiative. He was meant to be here with us today, but unfortunately he is unwell and was unable to make it. And I would like also to thank the Norwegian partners that have been working with us. Why? Because it was two years ago, but not in this beautiful idyllic Gestein setting, because at that time we were still very much in the throes of the COVID pandemic, that online we launched the Oslo Medicines Initiative. After two years of work, our vision to try and bring the public and the private sector to have a dialogue, I think has been achieved because as Sarah will tell you, we have managed to really have a number of occasions where we were able to talk to each other, not least in a historic moment two weeks ago in Tel Aviv, where for the first time around the lunchtime discussion, we brought ministers, NSAs, and some of you present in the room were there with us, and also industry representatives. And we now got a formal mandate from our member states to continue to advance this work, to take it forward by setting up a neutral platform, doing what I think we do best at WHO, which is not to do everything ourselves, but to convene the, the best, the brightest, and the most committed, and take a neutral stance by listening to everyone and trying to bring people together to find the right solutions. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome our regional director, Dr. Hans Kluge, who really has been very determined to see this through, and we move forward because we know that we have his full support. Thank Hans. you, Natasha, and good afternoon, everyone. So indeed, it was actually at the European Health Forum Gastein exactly two years ago that the groundbreaking Oslo Medicines Initiative first came to life. And I also straight away would like to express appreciation to the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Services, Dr. Borin Inge Larsen, and wish him a swift recovery. Also, uh, Odin, Odin from the Norwegian uh, Medicines Agency, and our partners, the European Commission and uh, OECD. We have uh, Isabel here and Francesca. So, I am indeed quite proud to say that we are now in a new and important phase to improve people's access to life-saving medicines, including for rare diseases, building on the momentum we saw at our regional committee just two weeks ago in Tel Aviv in Israel. The ministerial session was quite something. Sitting around the same tables, we had for the first time the member states, the ministers, the patients, the insurers, the private industry, all with one commitment. Tackle the remaining challenges so that we can make access a reality. And I also want to give credit here to Ms. Nathalie Mold, the DG of FPA. 
A total of 19 ministers took the floor, and what was nice, it was both from West, East, and Center Europe. And the ministers all shared openly and quite frankly, because it was a closed door, the personal and professional tensions in providing access to these novel high-cost medicines. Especially when there is so much uncertainty over whether or not these medicines will actually deliver the promised benefits. The ministers highlighted the need for a safe space in which to discuss solutions and also to bust myths. And I want to thank them for their willingness to be open and their trust in WHO Europe to provide that space. We heard, very important, from non-state actors, and I want to highlight the contributions from some of the industries that work in the European markets. For example, some mentioned that the climate for innovation is not good enough, especially around patents. We also heard that there needs to be better evidence from the industry side so that we can actually understand what we are paying for. And some mentioned that the focus on pricing is misplaced, that this is one element only, given that the volumes for this novel and effective products are so low. So through the Oslo Medicines Initiative, we have laid the foundations on which trust can be built. Yes, it has taken time, but now we have a shared agenda and have reshaped the political discourse. Now we need to move forward with purpose and determination. It's time to stop discussing our differences and find areas of common ground for concrete action. And we believe that by putting patience first, there is enough of a shared agenda for us to move forward. This ministerial lunch culminated in a WHO statement, which is quite a milestone. And Dr. Sarah Gardner will elaborate a bit further on this. But the statement gives WHO Europe the mandate to set up the neutral platform between public and private sector. And now it is up to all of us to make something out of it. The OMI has clearly thought us that progress can only become real if issues are addressed collectively and constructively, rather than by pointing fingers. And this neutral platform will include all stakeholders in the same spirit of collaboration we have seen since the beginning. Many of you know that when I became the Regional Director and launched the European Program of Work, I promised that I would not shy away from difficult issues. And this initiative is part of my commitment to that. When we first discussed OMI, the world was a very different place. And while our health systems were under pressure then, things have only worsened in the last two years with health budgets pushed to breaking point from Europe through Central Asia. We need to drive changes where we can, urgently, and once again, together. Thank you for your consideration, your commitment, and your compassion for the most vulnerable, for whom initiatives like the OMI are intended in our region quest to aspire to and achieve hell for all, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans, for the clarity with which you have uh, shared your thoughts and also the openness with which you shared the very candid discussion that took place during the lunch in Tel Aviv. And now um, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to Sarah, who will share with you what we have done through the Oslo Medicines Initiative. Of course, it will be a quick uh, tour, but at least you will be able to know where you need to get to if you want to learn more and if you want to read some of the very, very important materials that have been produced. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Natasha. Um, thank you very much to Hans um, for your introductory remarks, and thank you to you all um, for coming um, to this session. So as Natasha said, I'm just going to walk through um, some of the highlights of the Oslo Medicines Initiative. Uh, celebrates what's been achieved and lay the ground for the next steps. Um, so the strategic, what did we set out to do with this? Um, we looked across other initiatives that had taken place um, from UN and other agencies and even some of the countries themselves. Um, and what we felt was that one of the missing things, there was plenty of technical work, but what was missing was one of the real discourse between the stakeholders about how to fix this problem. 
There was very polarised views about what was causing it and whose fault. Um, and those conversations seem to have been going around certainly throughout all my career and getting more and more entrenched. So what we really wanted to do um, was build partnerships. So, so redress some of these, let's get out of these trenches and to try and focus on the solutions. So what are we going to do for those patients? Um, I'm really reshaping that political discourse. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals recognise the importance of strong healthcare systems and strong industry. We need both of those. Um, and we also need um, that partnership to achieve the goals. And certainly for medicines, you, we wouldn't have any medicines without industry. So we need that innovation, but we also need our healthcare systems to be sustainable. So how do we square that circle? And we had three pillars, which was solidarity, that's between member states, between partners, um, and with patients, transparency, um, the importance of as it's a tool to build trust and sustainability, as I mentioned, for our healthcare systems um, and our industry. The key important thing in building those new relationships was discussion. So we spent a lot of time um, online due to the pandemic, but doing consultations and discussions with the key stakeholders. Um, we produced a short background paper um, and then put the proposal forward to set up this platform and ask for responses and inputs, and we got them, which are now contained in the report, which you can read on the OMI website. So our, our member states and non-state actors really told us what they thought, what they were struggling with. Um, alongside, we wanted to build the evidence base um, there's a lot of materials around different aspects of medicines, regulation, procurement, innovation, patents. It's, it's quite a, a wealth of material. But we, what we wanted to do was really take a little bit of a step back and focus on going forward and focus on the relationships um, between the systems we're operating in and the different people, so rather than just the technical aspects in themselves. Um, and so we brought in um, colleagues from academia, from NGOs, um, to really... Um, tell us, um, informers, um, providers with the evidence, um, and we held a series of technical webinars um, which were open to, the, to everybody um, so we could really hear those different perspectives. Um, just before the regional committee, um, we published our technical report series. Um, we have eight papers under the OMI umbrella, um, plus another one from the observatory, um, and another one around um, legal aspects around transparency. For the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all these titles in detail. Um, there's a QR code at the end, so you can scan the code um, and go to those technical report series. Um, one of the ones we wanted to think about probably has, has less um, airing in these um, different arenas is the role of non-price incentives. We talk a lot about high price medicines, but the, the systems, the public systems, the universities, the healthcare systems, also, and governments themselves also provide a lot of other incentives um, in which the private sector collaborates, works with us. So I'm thinking things like innovation grants, um, clinical trial infrastructure, the universities generating early phase research. So we wanted to step back and really think about, we have the price incentives, but what other incentives are there in the system that we could offer towards innovation rather than it all coming out of the healthcare systems through price? And the other one I wanted to highlight here was really the um, lower middle income countries. So for high income countries, we know that the high priced medicines generally are the cell and gene therapies in this context, maybe some of the newer cancer medicines. Um, but for the lower middle income countries, it's a different set of medicines we're talking about. These cell and gene therapies are far out of the reach of those populations. And we really need to think about how we bring them. The markets are there. The need is there. So how do we bring the, those countries along with us, um, leaving no one behind and reducing inequities? So on to the um, statement by WIC Europe. Um, Hans has given you um, the introduction uh, about the ministerial lunch, um, which was a, a very exciting moment, I think, after two years of hard work and contributions from everybody. Um, the statement is available online, but again, I just wanted to highlight the commitments that have been made going forwards. So we've told you what we've, we've done. So what does the next phase look like? 
Um, as Hans mentioned, um, we now have the mandate, so we were seeking support from our member states to establish this joint stakeholder platform, which we're going to facilitate. Um, we don't supply the medicines as WHO, and we don't pay for the medicines. So our role is facilitator. The discussions have to happen between the public and the private sector, with civil society um, working there, the patients working there in the mix to, to try and move this forward. Um, we want to bring together all these different entities, we recognise the importance of all of these non-state actors, non-governmental organisations, private sector, and within WHO we have the philanthropic foundations and the academic institutions, along with our partners who've been working with, um, and we have the Commission and OECD with us today um, to talk about their involvement. We want to focus on proposals and solutions. We want to get real with this um, and really try and identify what might work for all the stakeholders. Um, we have some early ideas, um, but we need more input. Um, there's plenty of possibilities if you look at the literature. So which are the ones that we can make the most of? Um, what could be possible? What would people like to see? So I'm asking everybody to engage, again, engage with this. Um, and this is participation on a voluntary basis. Again, we want the coalition of the willing um, to come and shape what the work looks like going forwards. Um, and these are the technical areas of collaboration that we're looking for. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. There are others. Again, the next phase is about shaping what those agenda, um, picking the priorities. So in that statement, we talk about continuing the implementation of the transparency resolution. Um, there's a lot of things there from the side of the public sector and the private sector which could be more um, transparent and that's even before we get into discussions about price, the, the pros and cons of price transparency. Critical horizon scanning, um, we have many of these new high cost medicines on the horizon which is great news for patients but they're going to represent a massive challenge for our healthcare systems so let's be aware of them, let's plan. And then mechanisms to generate reliable evidence. At the moment, the discussion is whose responsibility is it to generate this evidence. Um, it's falling mostly to the public sector, but can we have better risk sharing in that discussion? New funding approaches, and then voluntary and collaborative cross-country mechanisms. Uh, how, we've got some good exemplars in the region, good exemplars out of the region, so how can we learn for those and see what might be feasible in this region? And then finally, governance governance of the um, public sector, governance of the private sector, and the role of civil society. So how do we together um, make that um, social contract to take this forward and be held accountable for what, what we're going to deliver? And I just want to leave you with a little quote. I think this is probably the first time Farrell Williams has been um, quoted <laughs> at the European um, Health Forum. Um, but he said, don't, reach for the star, don't wait for the stars to align. Reach up, rearrange them the way you want them to be. Create your own constellation. So I'm asking for everybody here to work with us to create that new constellation so we can have access for patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for really walking us through all the work that has been done. And thank you to you and the team who has worked so hard in sometimes quite challenging circumstances over the past two years. And taking the cue from Sarah, um, we want you to help us to reach up, rearrange the stars to create the constellation. And so it's my pleasure to introduce another colleague, Chris Scotter, who in a very agile format, because we had to make some changes due to Björninger's absence um, from the workforce team, has stepped in to help us. And he will tell you a little bit more about what we expect from you and what we want to hear from you during this session to make it as interactive as possible. It's really heartening to see the room so full, but we don't just want you to sit here, we want to get the most we can out of you over the next hour or so. Over to you, Thank Chris. you, Natasha. I'm your poor man's Bjorn Inge Larsen. So, welcome <laughs> and thank you very much for coming. Um, can I encourage everybody to uh, participate on Slido, make your comments and your questions. I'll be monitoring those. And at the end, we'll attempt to answer those in a Q&A. Um, we're going to have audience poll responses um, as well that we're going to be looking at. Um, for online members, uh, you can find it on the platform, the conference platform, or by scanning the, um, the, the barcode. Um, for colleagues here in the room, again, go 
to the slido.com, use hashtag Luna, and uh, use the uh, barcode uh, to enter your um, responses um, to the polls. So the first question, if I can ask us to pull it up, um, is what are the priority actions for supporting better access for patients? Thank you. While those uh, responses are polling, um, Sarah, I think, is going to take us through the first session, highlighting the importance of uh, stakeholder engagement throughout this process. And she'll introduce our colleagues who are joining us now on the lectern. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Chris. And I can, it's fascinating seeing those results coming in. Um, it was a tough question. We know they're all important. Um, but this is the job ahead of us as well, is to start really trying to prioritize about where we put our initial efforts. So thank you for helping us um, with this process. Um, so stakeholders have been critical. I, I covered this, and Hans covered this, and Natasha in the introduction. Um, WHO is the neutral platform. We're acting as the neutral platform. We're providing it um, on which our stakeholders can come together. So, so their interaction and engagement is critical um, for this initiative to achieve success. Um, and that is everybody. So that is um, uh, the public sector, the private sector, and our other non-state actors, very critically important. Um, as I mentioned, the decisions that happen around access to medicine, a lot of these are at a company level or a national level. Um, but I really do believe that the solutions um, will be found in that collaboration and ideas that can happen. Um, and it has to be voluntary. WHO is not mandating anything. Um, we're not mandating what the payers should be paying for. We're not mandating what the companies um, will be charging, which, which molecules they're going to be bringing through. This, this is a voluntary process. Um, but we've seen an awful lot of commitment from our sta different stakeholders to finding that solutions and really putting patients first. Um, and I'm delighted here to be joined by three of our stakeholders. I wish we could have had more, but we've got a short, short, uh, short session. Um, so we have Yanis, Alexandra and Simona. So thank you very much um, for joining us. Um, I'm going to give them, um, rather than do a formal presentation, we thought we'd try and make it a little bit more interactive. So we set them all the same question. Um, so I'm going to ask them each in turn the same question. Um, so I'm starting off, so what are the key challenges for the Oslo Medicines Initiative work going forward? So from your perspective, what are the key challenges and what are the next steps you would like to see? Um, so I'm going to start, Simona, on my left, if you could start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much, Sarah and uh, um, Dr. Kluge and uh, Natasha for having your audience involved in the OMI initiative for the past two years. And also, Sarah, I would like to thank you for the, I uh, counted well, eight publications that came out of mm. the OMI that m fulfills my new, new Year's resolution of writing 12 books. So that eight <laughs> counts towards that. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. That's a, we are in September, so we'll have some bonuses too. Uh, but for, uh, first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to have the voice of 30 million people living with rare diseases across the WHO Europe region to engage in such an important initiative. And I say, and I would like to underline the importance of this initiative. We've been waiting for quite some time mm. for this to happen. I don't want to blow our own trumpet, but in 2018, we published a breaking the access deadlock to leave no one behind, highlighting a structure, a new structure approach based on four pillars along the life cycle of medicine. I really appreciate the focus that the OMI initiative has on the overall life cycle of a medicine. Because back then, we looked at how we can reduce and actually uh, optimize the development pathway towards uh, access to therapies. Because in rare diseases, we have two fundamental problems. One, we don't have enough therapies. And two, we don't have the timely access to the available therapies, and therefore, we are a little bit between the devil and the deep blue sea, if I take one of the English expression, because the Italians are a little bit more colorful than that. Um, we need to really bring the collaboration together. Really appreciate this. In terms of the, specifically on the question that we have, that you have, in terms of the challenges, we are 
extremely excited about the, the uh, prospect of new scientific development, both in, tra both in traditional and uh, uh, other type of, of, of therapies, such as cell and gene therapies. But they bring a lot of challenges with them. How do we reconcile the challenges from the public investment, the private investment, in the, in the patient, in, and the patient needs? That's the key solution. I firmly, and we firmly believe, that Europe could again become a leader in innovation if it puts the patient needs first. If we drive from that, from a public investment, this, the private investment, and together, we can do a, 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 um, a great deal for the entire European economy, not only for the patient. And therefore, the challenge is really there. How do we reconcile the two? Also with very tight pockets at the moment. In terms of what we would like to see in, in the follow-up to the OMI, first and foremost, the collaboration that is unlikely to build trust between the different stakeholders involved. Um, and secondly, bringing forward some of the elements that back in 2018, not many people picked up, but throughout the pandemic, those elements such as differential pricing, the equity tier based pricing, more uh, joint or uh, common procurement, just to name a couple of them, um, building evidence based on real world data, that's also um, uh, integrating, integrated follow the, uh, follow the pandemic. How we do it in practice, that's very important to us. And I would suggest three, if I may. One is a, an established position of Eurordis and to create a European infrastructure to support the data generation post authorization. That is to address the risk related to the uncertainties that many of these one-off therapies are bringing. We know that they have value. We don't know how much value is there. We desperately need them, but we're also painfully aware that they, their cost is potentially out of reach for society. And that brings it to a systemic failure to address the patient need. The second is not to forget the, um, the let's say, uh, all the medicines perhaps that might um, go into region in the w, uh, or, or member states in the, in the WHO wider European region that have not been there. And that using collective procurement, um, different types of, of um, purchasing agreement between different countries. And thirdly, to look at um, creating networks of center of excellence to deliver the cell and gene therapies. Because we have many pockets of expertise in certain countries, we can relay them and bring them towards the wider European region, and that will be benefit everyone, from science to the industry and to the public. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for um, those really important points. Um, and yes, and, and we look forward to discussing some of the proposals your audit has been working on um, under the Czech presidency, the European Union. So, so thank you. Alexandra, your turn now at the same questions. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, inviting FPA. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute consistently to the conversations and, and uh, um, expert debates um, around this initiative. Um, in, in fact, in 2020, when this initiative was, uh, was launched in the European Health Forum Gastein, I, I was in the audience as a young Forum Gasteiner, and, and I remember feeling, leaving the session feeling quite curious about what will happen next but also really um, yeah, had, had the feeling of, of, um, of uh, hope, yeah, being hopeful that uh, we have all the right stakeholders um, around the, the table to really put forward solutions and, and practical solutions. So um, I, I hope that the audience today will leave with, with the same kind of, of feeling, um, more aware, more um, engaged and, and more empowered for all of us to, to play our particular role in, in making access to medicines um, um, a reality. Um, and and it, it really needs a, a common approach and, and uh, um, uh, joining forces. For, uh, for us um, in, in FPI, we really have a, a tradition or a habit of, of co-creating solutions, proposing uh, solutions after really discussing them with all stakeholders and, and aligning. 
In fact, I'm really happy to, to be on the same pa panel as uh, Simone because we, together with Rodis, have joined, uh, uh, have launched a joint paper on access to medicines for rare disease, where we put forward six concrete proposals of areas where our um, we, we both align. Uh, also, there are a few points where we don't align, but, but that we can uh, tackle differently. But really, with these six proposals, it's an area of, of alignment, and we, we believe that we can move these proposals forward. Um, and, and our industry really has uh, a role to play, and, and we're happy to contribute and, and uh, step up to that role. Um, we have concrete actions that we have proposed to make sure that uh, medicines, across, well, patients across Europe and, and citizens across Europe have access to their medicines. In fact, it was FPA that uh, started documenting uh, the delays in access and unavailability with our patient weight indicator, and then um, try to propose a few solutions um, with our root causes of unavailability and delays uh, report. Um, but this year we've made a step forward. We have a commitment and our members really uh, stand behind that commitment to make access to medicines across Europe um, a reality within two years of, of their approval uh, centrally in, in EMA. And then not only uh, making them um, available, to, but really making sure that this process is transparent to everyone in a portal that we, we are keen to um, launch uh, together with other stakeholders and, and invite stakeholders to join the board of this portal. And then we're really, because of course pricing is, is a hot topic, really keen to start a conversation about what is the adequate and equitable price level for each country um, to be able to um, integrate medicines quickly into their reimbursement systems. Now when it comes to your questions and, and the challenges, I think uh, a few challenges. First of all, um, it's, it's the times we live in, uh, because we are of course faced with, with um, really uh, uh, stepping up in innovation and, and scientific advances, but at the same time we're faced with the, uh, the energy crisis and, and a war in our region. So really hope that uh, health will not fall um, off the priority list, let's say, and, and will continue to be top of mind for, for this region and, and for the institutions and, and public stakeholders uh, across the region. Um, and then um, the, the, the challenge is uh, um, really how do we make sure that policy keeps up with the advances in, in science? Science is, is developing really fast and, and our members and our industry is re are really trying to break the code of some disease. But then how do we make sure that policy keeps up with, with all this, uh, these advances? Um, and then maybe room from, for improvement, not, not really a challenge, but we, we need to continue to build trust uh, that this joint platform and, and co-creating sol uh, solutions is, is the way forward. So how do we see things as, as next steps? Um, it's, we are, we're really keen to contribute, especially in those areas where we can see maybe quick wins, immediate gains, so then to be able to build the trust that this initiative works and that stakeholders can align and are willing to work together. And then for us, it would be really important to have as many member states joining this initiative because really that's where the citizens and, and patients um, need to direct their attention to and, and really for the WHO to be able to convene those member states so that we, we not only have a let's say, a regional um, platform of dialogue, but really go grassroots. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, um, Alexander. Some uh, interesting points. Um, and again, I wish we had a bigger stage, more, more time. Um, but so in addition to FPA participating, um, also want to thank the other industry bodies who've been collaborating on OMI. So we had the parallel traders, the, the wholesalers, UCOPE um, and the generics and biosimilar industry. So we, 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 this is an ecosystem. Um, so any changes have to be acceptable to all and we have to note the potential impacts. Um, so we're ensuring that we're having those conversations and they join us on this platform. Yanis, mm -hmm. last but not least. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I work for EASY, the European Social Insurance Platform. And I can say 
I'm very humbled and proud of the members. And the members of EZIP are actually the national social security institutions. The institutions that actually pay for everything that we benefit from, from employment benefits, family benefits, our pensions, and of course, healthcare. Why am I saying this? Because luckily, since I joined EZIP, I realized that it, there is a much bigger picture. And that here we're talking about medicines, but I hear from my members, we are running out of money on several fronts, especially in the times we live in today in Europe. And I think, unfortunately, I don't want to be the party pooper because we're here in Gastein, but we are going um, mathematically with our, our, our backs against the wall in light of the perma crisis that we heard uh, right before in the plenary session. Um, my members are solidarity-based members, uh, and effectively they're the statutory social security institutions, uh, and I think you will agree with me, um, they represent what um, makes uh, Europe unique, which is this uh, social coverage that we all, all enjoy from. Um, and therefore we do welcome, of course, the, the discussion around um, the affordability, sustainability, and of course, solidarity, and I'm very happy that you have identified uh, solidarity and sustainability as key themes of the OMI. I remember it from the beginning, from the very start. And it's great that WHO Europe is taking this discussion forward uh, because there is indeed a, a challenge. Um, and I don't think, definitely not for myself, I don't think we should get to the point where the dilemma is not innovation versus access, but innovation versus solidarity. Is that the question? How do we make sure we don't get to that point of innovation versus solidarity? Um, and therefore, I think there are some concrete steps. Actually, we agree with the six areas you, you mentioned, um, because we do see some worrisome, alarming, uh, systemic trends uh, in, in terms of specific medicinal products that are going to break the bank. I remember the discussions we had in this room uh, back in 2014, 2015. Um, and therefore, there I would say very concretely from our side, we would uh, welcome the prioritization of issues such as horizon scanning, uh, the robust evidence generation for timely and informed decisions, and we've actually presented very detailed amendments to the marketing authorization framework in Europe on how to strengthen the evidence generation that has uh, uh, multiple impl implications down the road and enables also um, the timely access for patients. Why? Because it makes the life of the other downstream decision makers easier. Um, of course, please enable the, the sharing of information. Why am I saying this? Because this is important to address the information asymmetries. What does this mean? That one side knows more than the other side. What does this mean? What does this translate into? It translates into a power imbalance. Therefore, we must address this information asymmetry. Um, and therefore, so um, affordable pricing options, that's something that we would like uh, the WHO Europe to prioritize and take forward. And of course, um, and I will conclude, I'm already faster than you, you want me to, um, strengthen the areas of competition. Strengthen the areas of competition because I think we, we will all agree in this room, we want to make sure that the incentives that the legislator very generously grants to the companies, to the manufacturers, and the manufacturers deliver some fantastic innovation, but we want to make sure that those incentives are not abused, misused, or overused. And therefore, it is important to really look at that through the prism of a healthy, robust competition. And of course, the overarching endeavor, and I conclude with this, is how do we align, Natasha mentioned aligning, and this is the theme of this session, how do we align health, industrial, and research policies? I don't have the answer to that, but good luck. We are here to, to help <laughs> you out. Uh, uh, but congratulations on the next steps. Thank you very much for inviting us. Yeah, thank you very much, Yanis. And that, that is indeed one of the questions that we need to look at. And just, I think, by asking that question about how do we um, reconcile them. I think maybe we, we can't hope to align them, but maybe we can at least have a discussion about the fact that they could be pulling in different directions um, with the patients in the middle. So we, we need to really think about that. Um, we've got, uh, I think, very quick five minutes. Um, I'm just going to do you a, a quick fire question um, at the end before I hand over um, to Chris. So um, the quick follow-up question was, 
how will you be measuring success? So you're all contributors to this platform. So how will we know if we succeed or not? Savona, starting with you. Of course, but that's well, a million dollar question, if, you, if I may. Um, the, the, the success depends what uh, we want to measure it against. For us, um, primarily, already the fact that the Tel Aviv meeting happened, it's a great, possibly a watershed moment in the way that the WHO Europe region collaborates in this area. If we continue to work on specific areas, and already narrowing down the list is one, um, I think that we will have um, uh, some success. And if you have us, we'll participate. And already the, the fact of being at the table with the discussion will, for us, be a success. But if I may just have a 30 second yeah. to respond to Yanis, how do we align those stars? We start with the patient. We do shaping the horizon. And we took the stars and we pull it together. The fact is that if you start with the patient needs and we direct research and resources throughout the health system, you're mentioning that there is not enough uh, money in the healthcare systems. If a rare disease patient has to go on average on seven different um, um, specialists to get a correct diagnosis and taking five years to have a proper diagnosis, look at all the waste that there is in there. If we move towards more, uh, for example, newborn screening when it's applied across Europe or use of genome, genome uh, screening, that we will have a saving in the, in, in, in the system already. Thank you very much. And yes, you will certainly um, have an invitation to that table um, alongside the other patient organisations and civil society, um, those who have contributed in date and those that we hope will contribute in the future. So same question to you, Alexandra. How will we measure success? Very good, very interesting question indeed. So I, I would say that maybe it's, it's worth looking at where we will be in a year from now and where will we be in, a, in 10 years from now. So in, in a year from now, I think success will be having even more stakeholders around the table, brainstorming, feeling confident and, and being open to share their perspectives and, and add value. And in, in 10 years from now, I think success could be measured in having more medicines for European patients, more research and development being done in Europe, more European-based companies, um, and then after having more medicine, more innovation, then having that innovation available for more, more um, citizens across Europe and at a sustainable um, and, and consistent um, um, way, in a way, in a way, sustainable way for healthcare systems and then, and then um, for patients as well. No, thank you. Um, and just, yes, thank you for highlighting the fact that this is, this is actually a global stage um, that we have. Um, so we have to think about um, Europe in the context of the other um, regions as well. So thank you. Yanis? Especially nowadays. Yeah. Uh, how would we measure success? I would say, uh, based on my experience in this field over the past uh, 10 years um, or more, actually, um, is... I will be very happy if you manage to uh, gather all the right people in a specific forum and you can have a direct um, and clear priority setting um, followed by um, a concrete uh, roadmap, an inventory of action. Because this is, I think, what definitely uh, what will rally support, not only on the member state level, but also speaking for my own uh, members, and many of them are public authorities or di directly linked to, uh, to the governments. We need to have, I think, right now, and I see that in the case of the European Commission, I hear a lot of voices. There are a lot of topics on the agenda, especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. I'm not so sure that you're going to manage to make everyone happy. Uh, that is why, therefore, um, what I would say is, you know, how, do we, uh, how are we strategic? How do we lose sight of the big issues and priorities? Um, and, and that we can measure in a year's time from now by saying that we've accomplished or we made some progress on two, three, because I think anything beyond that is, is overly uh, uh, optimistic or ambitious. Uh, that would be for me an indicator of success. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for setting out that clear um, roadmap for us uh, about what we need to do in the next forthcoming months. So thank you. And I think may maybe our goal is to have everybody equally unhappy as well. And then we'll perhaps be doing something right. <laughs> so thank you very much to our panelists uh, for joining us. Um, I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to summarize um, the Slido, and then over to Natasha for the next. Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, as you can see, 82 uh, participants and another participant ranking. Um, so um, 
it's looking very much very clear at the top that transparency and affordable pricing options are joint first, um, with evidence generation following as people's preferred third option. But interestingly enough, governance not so far behind and significant interest in horizon scanning and demand pooling. So, Sarah, I welcome you to sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Sarah, for moderating the first part of our session. And thank you also to the panelists. And I know that there are going to be many people who are going to want to reflect and to join. But before that, this is a very big endeavor. So as WHO, we knew straight away that it was not something that we could do on our own. And for this reason, we are very fortunate to have by our sides uh, the European Commission and OECD, who joined us also during the lunch at Tel Aviv. And I think the strength and the promise of going forward is going forward together. So I'm delighted to welcome Francesca Colombo from OECD and Isabel de la Mata from the European Commission, DG Sante, to join us here. And then I think we've got Michael hopefully joining us online as well. Is, he, is Michael connected? Is Michael connected? Michael, are you connected? Excellent. Yes, and we have Michael from the European Medicines Authority too, who could not be with us in person, but we have Michael on screen. So, um, uh, I think really what we would like to hear from you is how can this planned initiative actually complement and support your work on one hand, and on the other hand, what activities would you like to see undertaken in this platform? So how does this platform support and complement your existing work? And what would your wish list for the work to take forward be? Can I start with Isabel on behalf of the European Commission? Thank you, Natasha. And uh, thank you to the WHO, the Norwegian Ministry of uh, Health and, uh, and Care Services and the Norwegian Medicine Agency for launching this initiative. So to everybody uh, that uh, has been involved uh, because um, uh, the increase in the access uh, to affordable and effective um, innovative medicines is the, the main objective of one of the crucial objectives of the pharmaceutical strategy for Europe. So it's fitting um, very well with your efforts uh, from this uh, initiative, the Oslo, the Oslo initiative. So uh, from, the, from the point of view of the European Union, the European Commission, one of the uh, important steps has been the adoption of the uh, regulation on the health technology assessment that uh, allows, uh, well, introduce the horizon scanning, joint scientific assessment at EU level, so that uh, at the same time increase the transparency and support the negotiations with the uh, with the, the companies and the national decisions, but um, uh, now um, we we try to advance in the goals for uh, access to affordable medicines, and uh, what we are doing first is the. Uh, revision of the EU pharmaceutical legislation. So we have a um, long time, very solid pharmaceutical legislation that has been in place for many years and that uh, we think that has uh, supported the, to have uh, safety, efficacy, quality of the medicines for the European patients. Uh, but now we want to go further to revise the, the legislation and to promote more uh, a patient-centered innovation with a focus on the unmet medical needs. Um, the, the, second, the second thing that we are doing is the cooperation in the area of pricing and reimbursement. It's something that um, we began many years ago that was stopped uh, for a while and that we are back now following the call from the member state uh, to the commission to work on that, on that area. So there are many different areas uh, where we, we will have to make progress uh, and, uh, in a collaborative uh, way. Um, for example, uh, to, to engage uh, with the member state uh, to implement non-legislative uh, uh, measures to improve the transparency. I mean, not, uh, not every, the, the regulation is not everything. Uh, it's important and has been very important for us, but could be our collaboration that uh, is not uh, just uh, a, a regulation. <laughs> then we are also supporting the regional initiatives. So we have also other um, uh, 
other example, uh, uh, for example, the Valeta Initiative or the Benelux uh, One that, that are working not the, in the whole European Union, but at regional level, level not only at national, at national level. Then we have been uh, working for, for a while, and you know the public procurement of medicines. And um, we have worked also on, on other issues, but uh, that could have different levels, local, national, regional, uh, uh, and cross-country level, uh, European, uh, European level. And now we are, we are doing, we are finalizing a study uh, on um, how we could uh, optimize the, the, uh, the uh, access the, uh, to medicines uh, through, through this public procurement. And uh, well, we have uh, also the generation of evidence. So, uh, and we have been uh, working with the OECD, of course, in the in monitoring the access to, to novel medicines. Uh, so, uh, we think that um, this initiative, I mean, the Oslo initiative, supports what we are trying to do, and what we are trying to do support the, the initiative. So, it's a uh, well, as we have uh, repeated several times. Uh, win-win initiative and that uh, that I think that uh, will will obtain this uh, access for all the patients to, to better medicines and uh, but uh, also taking into account what has been mentioned by the by the, the previous speaker so the the need for the social security system or the health system to uh, get uh, access for everybody to have solidarity and, and etc to have into account the, the needs of the companies that are the ones that have to de to develop uh, and and to to take of course into account the needs of the patient and especially uh, what is the unmet current needs of the patient thank you thank you very much isabel and thank you again for highlighting that this is really i think an area where we can complement each other we have very different responsibilities and competencies but at the same time very much shared values and objectives. And I think that we should not underestimate the importance of work that is done within the European Union and the impact that it can have even beyond the European Union. So with this now, I would like to come to Francesca. Francesca, how, how does our work going forward in this platform support your work <laughs> and what would you like to contribute and see happening. Sure, and I, as a first thing, I could not agree more with what Isabel said. It's not so much how this work um, is helpful for our work, it's actually also how our work at OECD is helpful for this initiative and so forth. I mean, there is definitely a huge alignment which uh, through these initiatives has come very, very clear. Uh, we work obviously with European countries, we work also with non-European countries, and we have for many years looking been looking at the issues of uh, uh, access to innovative uh, medicine. So somehow there is an alignment. So I don't think it's a matter of, uh, you know, uh, your initiative supporting us or us supporting you. We need to do all of it together. But definitely we are somewhat different, so we can probably uh, focus on what our respective uh, strengths. So as a first thing that I would see for, for this uh, initiative is really this, uh, this dialogue and this getting uh, the different uh, um, stakeholders uh, together, which is particularly important. It's quite clear that the trust has been broken when you talk about uh, pharmaceuticals uh, in terms of uh, do we really get uh, the access uh, in an affordable way to necessary medicines, but also I would say do we get the right innovation that we need. There are a number of areas in which there are clear unmet needs and where somehow there is no alignment in terms of the incentives for industry to go there, so quite clearly the, needs, uh, the, the, the trust is broken, broken, and I think from uh, what I would ask, you know, and expect from this initiative and from uh, from WHO is really to continue that platform from dialogue. I think there are some very important sort of principles for a well-functioning uh, pharmaceutical markets, which are important and need to be reaffirmed, but on which we need to have somehow an agreement, uh, and probably that could be a, a starting point also for you. I mean, it's we when we did that report on uh, uh, sustainable access to innovative medicine that was uh, in uh, um, about four years ago, we identified some building principle uh, linked to uh, the purpose overall the pharmaceutical market so it should not be to reduce spending in itself, but really to improve uh, the value, you know, what you get out of, uh, of the spending on pharma. The important principles of tier pricing, because obviously you want to have, uh, you know, more transparency, but you don't want to have 
you know, the same exact price is being paid by high income countries as well as low income countries. Otherwise, the consequence would be either that the prices are too high for the poorer country, or on the other hand, that the prices are too low and you get no innovation whatsoever. Um, issues around having a rule-based system, a predictable system that helps obviously the industry and helps uh, uh, payers uh, uh, as well. Foster more competition in the pharmaceutical markets and improve the transparency. So those were the principles that we identified. And I think somehow this, this, this platform, this dialogue should go back to those principles and see are we really in agreement uh, with, with all of that. In terms of what uh, OECD uh, role will be doing, of course, as you know, we are very much uh, pushing an agenda for improving the uh, evidence-based, which very much links also to the transparency. If you're talking about transparency, it's transparency around what? We need to have much better and more transparent, more public authoritative information about the pharmaceutical markets on all different aspects. On access, for example, in terms of measuring, really, and defining mechanism for understanding when there is uh, access to medicine and how to really properly measure that. And that's something that we are working uh, with the support also of the uh, Commission and also of, uh, of Norway. Um, in terms of uh, better indicators of industry performance, uh, in, in terms of revenues, in terms of activities, it's a very, very, very opaque uh, market. We need to have much better indicators in, in terms of what goes in, what are the processes, and then ultimately, obviously, what comes out, including on things like what's the level of public funding of R&D, which, uh, which is fundamental. Uh, issues related to you know, ways to enhance competition on, on patent uh, uh, markets, for example. Greater uh, understanding of better data, also on things like uh, how much we spend on pharmaceuticals. We have very good data on retail uh, spending. But only few countries are able really to, uh, to collect data on what happens in hospitals. And the majority of specialty high-priced pharmaceuticals are actually delivered in inpatient uh, settings. So we need to have much better information there. And then, obviously, there is a lot of talk about transparency. But, uh, and, you know, that's where OECD can, can add value. Are we talking about transparency of what? Are we talking about transparency of outcomes, transparency on R&D spending? Then we need to have much more. Or transparency on prices and under what conditions does transparency on prices bring, brings to uh, better results. So I'll stop in there, um, but you know, I think there is clearly a, a huge role for all, all our free organizations and for many others. Thank you very much, Francesca, for that really comprehensive overview. And also, I think, just listening again to the principles you outlined, that ties very, very much and aligns very much with our pursuit for a social contract, a market where um, it, it functions, but within a social environment. So I think just listening again to those principles, they tie in very nicely with the social contract. So now I would like to ask Michael. Michael, the European Medicines Agency has had a really critical role, particularly during the pandemic, but moving beyond the pandemic and coming to think about this platform, we hear or we heard throughout the consultation often the need for the regulatory process to be more uh, appreciative of the context beyond quality, safety, efficacy, so to say. We very much look forward also to hearing your views from EMA. Over to you. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting EMAs to today's prestigious event. Um, and I think I can really say from the outset, it's a huge alignment with the previous speakers, and I'm really glad to pick up on a couple of themes which I've heard so far during this session, so really uh, enlightening. Um, let me start by saying that the Oslo Medicines Initiative has brought together public and private players, policymakers, technical contributors, providers and patient, and it's really an honor to be part of this conversation, how to now progress this work through the WHO Euro Access to Novel Medicines Initiative. And access to novel medicines is really a public health matter involving a variety of contributors and stakeholders, as we have heard so far. And the technical reports from the OMI they provide really a wide spectrum on these dimensions of solidarity, transparency, sustainability, cutting across all these reports. Now, 
the decision making chain that ultimately leads to patient uh, access is designed to allow consequential reviews in a stepwise manner. And that comes a bit also to your point just now, Natasha, about the different responsibilities, because each decision maker, of course, has their specific remit um, with resulting scope and, and methodologies. And of course, medicines regulators are part of this decision making chain. And of course, also to be clear that pricing considerations and affordability are outside the scope of the regulatory review. Our focus is on benefit risk decision on individual medicines, um, but then this should be the basis to contextualize the medicine's value in the healthcare setting. Now, with this being said, what all decision makers really have in common is the need to rest their decisions on evidence. And again, this term was coming um, in, in various contributions already. And this is therefore also an area where we see, as medicines regulators, we would like to see WHO Europe and its new platform to undertake specific activity to foster this collaborative work. The technical reports, they have identified several touch points in this regard. Let me just briefly outline two examples. The report on payer-focused policy options includes performance-based mayors. To generate robust and high quality data on long term performance of a medicine can be demanded also by regulators, so there are opportunities for synergies. Application of such cross decision maker cooperation, for example, in the context of gene therapies would be extremely beneficial. Another mentioned policy option is the added value description through HDA. And in this space, we really benefited already from our established cooperation with HDA colleagues at European level over the past decade, exchanging views and evidence and methodologies. And here we also need to discuss a methodology such as extrapolation of evidence to not studied subpopulations. Vertical collaboration between regulators, HDAs, payers, and all other players is really of benefit. The central question is, how can we get closer around evidence design, generation, and review? ensuring that all decisions can rest on scientifically robust evidence. And how do we deal with uncertainties in evidence? And again, this I've heard several times already today, is this requires a fine balance, sound methodologies and robust follow-up framework. Particularly for innovative medicines and back to the theme, addressing unmet medical needs, those, if they are benefiting from early access schemes, such as condition marketing authorization, we need to discuss early on the evidence need and how to generate more data post-launch to address uncertainties. And now let me finish with just highlighting one particular example for engagement on post-licensing evidence. The Darwin EU network is one tool to explore further. It's a pan-European network on real-world data with the aim to give decision makers valid and trustworthy real world evidence, for example, on diseases and patient populations. And it's here really to say that the coordination center, which has been launched already, is now ready to deliver real world evidence studies and a workshop with HTAs and payers on potential use cases is going to happen in October, so in a few weeks time. So all of these activities, really to say they are reflected in the uh, work programs and strategies of European medicines regulators. And with its neutral platform, WO Europe provides an opportunity to bring these various stakeholders around the topics in support of these initiatives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for highlighting the importance of evidence, which was, of course, one of the top three um, uh, themes that were picked by you. And there's going to be just one last question again to our panelists. You can think about the answer again. What would success look like if we were to come back again in Gastein in two years' time to evaluate where we are? But in the meantime, before we come out to you, before Sarah comes out with the microphone to take your comments, feedback and reflections, I would like to pass the floor to Chris to again ask you to think about how we take this initiative forward. Thank you, Natasha. So we've given you the opportunity on the poll to rank uh, or to list the, your, your, your priorities in six options. And we want 
you'll all know the, 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 the context of a word cloud and how, how useful that is. So we want to take uh, observers' view online and in the audience, view on uh, what is required to take the initiative forward, the OMI initiative. Um, so please join the, uh, the, the, the poll and with one word um, comments, contribute to the word cloud, which Sarah will use going forward to stimulate thought and, uh, and further work. So uh, with that, I hand over to the audience and then back to Natasha. Thank you. Thank you. And get creative. I mean, I think we can think of many adjectives. They start coming up. But in the meantime, until you are thinking about what is required, I come back now to Michael, Francesca and Isabel. In your view, what would success look like? So, Michael first. Okay, thank you. So, um, well, I would say success eventually means access to innovative medicines for patients who need them. And as indicated earlier, really evidence should be the basis of all decision making along the chain. Measuring success, therefore, in this context relate to concrete work around product specific developments involving all the stakeholders, but also we should continue the conversation how we can get together on methodologies, maybe even aiming for joining up on guidelines. Thank you. Success of the specific initiative, just very briefly, success of the initiative is therefore to bring these parties together and to create the necessary means and tools, identify boundaries, interdependencies on the connected life cycle approach to medicine. And again, here the WHO uh, Euro platform can really provide that necessary framework to continue the collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for joining us remotely. Francesca, what does success look like to you uh, in two years' time? In two years' time. Well, first of all, because we like measurement, but if you could measure this level of trust between the different uh, partners that are here and see how it changed throughout uh, these two years, and uh, can you say that it has improved, uh, that we are in a, in a better place than it used to be, that there is more alignment of the stars or you know more constellation or whatever you want to say. I love stars and I love constellations, so it's, uh, you know. Uh, that would be the first thing. The other thing that definitely we want to have, uh, you know, a viable industry, but aligned with, uh, with people needs. And that alignment has to do with the access to innovative medicines where there are novel medicines, all of them, maybe they're not so innovative, but you know, it's, uh, that's one issue. But also that there is innovation in areas where currently there is no innovation. So I think that's, uh, you know, ensuring that we still have a viable industry, we need this but it's aligned to, uh, with uh, people's needs. Thank you, very clear. And Isabel, for you? Um, I think that uh, you have created a momentum and a political opportunity, and this uh, platform will allow that uh, all the stakeholders uh, are aligned. So I, I would say that we will have um, an indicator of a process that uh, will be how many stakeholders will be really in, in the platform. And, and if you, uh, or if we, are able to, to have everybody and make that nobody leave. The, ah, the no, nobody left behind. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but on their own, that would be even, even worse, that they leave because they, they don't agree with uh, how they, we, are, we are going on. And the second one that will be uh, uh, the result. I mean, nobody is able to, to, uh, to solve all the problems of accessibility, affordability on, on their own. So where are we in two, five, ten years? We will have more medicines that are available, that are available to, to everybody. Uh, I mean, we, we know now that most of the more innovative medicines are uh, really very expensive. So I, I don't say that they, that is not right. I mean that the, the cost is, is there, but we need to, to work to see how we can uh, do those very expensive medicines available to everybody that needs them and that does the solve. And also that um, uh, this initiative will allow to, to respond to the needs of everyone. I mean, the more um, frequent diseases, if I can say like that, uh, so that we have um, new medicines available for, for cancer, for cardiovascular diseases, also uh, responded to the uh, antimicrobial resistance, but also for the rare diseases and the m less uh, common uh, diseases. Thank you very much, Isabel. So I think we come to the point now where we ask Chris to show us uh, the Slido results, and then after that, I hand over to Sarah to bring in the voices from the floor. 
this is going to be challenged my eyesight. Um, but there's, um, as, as is the benefit of word clouds, the, the most popular ones come up the largest, so even a man like me can read. Um, so the things that I'm seeing coming through here are um, collaboration, trust, very important, political will, persistence. If nothing in health, we're persistent. Uh, but also solidarity, equity, priority setting and sustainability coming up there. Um, and interestingly growing at the bottom there, just peaking up his multi-stakeholder approaches. So lots of words to go on there. Sarah, can I hand back to you? Um, you certainly can, Chris. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder that there's the option, I think, to for the audience to put questions um, into the Slido, um, if I understood the technology correctly. It's never my strong point. But we have that option, and also we can take some questions um, from the floor. Um, so we've invited the speakers from the first panel to come up again. Natasha, do you want to come and take a seat? Are you, you all right there? Um, so, Chris, have we got any questions? We have. Um, so, before we go to the floor, a uh, couple of interesting questions here. Um, so, how do we deal with maximising the benefits of new and innovative drugs um, uh, alongside the benefits uh, and uh, the, the benefits? So, tongue-tied. Um, and measure that against the negative impacts on sustainability. What does that mean for procurement models? So this is, do you want to repeat the question again? I will, because obviously that, I've got so some very okay. blank yes. faces there. Yes. Um, there, it's a twofold one. So maximising the benefits of new drugs and in, innovative drugs, um, but how do you balance that against the, the, the impact of, uh, or the negative impacts okay. of investment in, in, in those drugs um, to ensure that you have an appropriate procurement model that balances existing yeah. drug supply but brings on new drugs. I, I think that this is about the value question, isn't it? That we that these medicines are expensive and we are actually investing in them, which means that we don't have money available to spend on other things. So how do we balance that? Yanis, I can see you, you're wanting to come in there. Yeah, actually, uh, because Sarah, you just said there is there is there is always a choice to make because uh, in in some cases we take resources uh, from uh, one side of the system and we put it in another. So there are critical decisions to take, especially coming from uh, for us when we have this panoramic perspective, as I said, all the way from pensions all the way to healthcare, um, to healthcare budgets. But to answer the first question, the way I see it, at least if I understand it correctly, it is all about having this robust evidence generation. We need to know. Um, what we are approving. We need to be asking the right questions early on in the process. We need to be enabling this collaboration. We have uh, Michael with us from um, uh, the EMA. Uh, these collaborations to make sure that we get an alignment, again using this mm -hmm. word, of the evidential requirements and the questions we're asking. And why is that important? Th this is important because otherwise um, then there are uh, problems down the road, there are delays, and I can assure you that from the payers or the buyers side, uh, the one that I represent, nobody wants to say no. Nobody wants to say no, I can assure you about that. But at the same time, the questions that we are asking, the questions that my members are asking, but also um, HCA agencies, those questions are not a nuisance. Those questions are valid. And those hurdles, if we can call them a, a hurdle, uh, putting a, a negative spin on them, are necessary for the system, especially in uh, the sense of uh, given that we have limited um, resources. Therefore, what I would try to, uh, to wrap up, uh, this is why for us it's an absolute priority and I, I'm glad to see that also the feeling in the room and I, I think also for WHO Europe, the question of evidence generation early on in the process is very, very important and will be prioritized down the road. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Yanis. And certainly um, coming from, I came to WHO from a national HTA payer organization. And certainly I can say colleagues used to really, really try and get these medicines through the systems um, for the patients. Um, does anyone else want to, Francesca, I can see. And then Before yeah, we just... open now quickly to okay. the floor. Okay. Do you want, to, do you want, to, do you want me to move? I, maybe we can take questions from the floor well, and yeah. get you then to reflect okay. at the end. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks a lot. I was a bit afraid that there was a priority for online people while you know, we're all here in the room. But uh, um, yeah, I was happy to hear, you know, uh, you know just to start, uh, I was happy to hear that Yanis now has a panel. Boris, you. I know you and many people know you, but maybe not everyone knows you. So could you perhaps <laughs> oh, yes, introduce Boris, yourself? Oh, that is from MSD. <laughs> and uh, so maybe, you know, thanks to the panoramic vision, 
you know, Yanis will understand that we're only 15% of his problem. So let's, uh, let's, let's start from that base. Uh, no, I, I, I guess, the, you know, the, the, my measure of success will, will be also when we start to take stock of, of the evolution of pharmaceutical expenditures over decades. Because as long as I've been working on, on, on in this field, it's, it's, you know, we look back and for over 20 years of cost containment measures, uh, pharmaceuticals represent 15% of budgets on average in Europe, net, retail plus hospital. There's a report from IQVIA from uh, last April. Uh, but the, the future, when I hear about the future, and it's, it's true across panels and reports and so forth, it's always doom and gloom. So we heard in the previous plenary that you know, some people like Hans like to uh, look at the, the, half, the, the glass half uh, full. And I think we should take stock of that. You know, cost, cost containment has worked. Every time there was a big scare, a new technology is going to break the budget. You don't even see uh, it when you look across 20 years. Okay. Just look at So my, my question is that pharmaceutical innovation over the years have de has developed along with uh, healthcare systems. It, and it has you know, been transformative uh, from acute care, secondary pre prevention, which was brought by technology. Okay. And now we're talking about cures. So the, the real issue, and that's really a, a fraction of what is spent on, on pharmaceuticals and, uh, and healthcare in, yeah. uh, in general, is those cures. How are we getting to design our health uh, systems and procurement models in so order to pay for those cures? And, Otherwise, yeah. they will not be invented. So th that's they'll, a they'll question about how we're going to do this. They will not be invented. Yeah. Shall we take a number yep. of questions yep. and comments? You're taking notes. We'll come back to you then for your final wrap-ups. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali from Hanover Communications. I work in the International Policy and Market Access team. Um, I, I found really fascinating hearing um, the view of the EMA and then Yen is your view as well. Um, and, and I actually, sorry, I actually wrote that question, but I'm going to just say it again. So I'm particularly interested in, in ensuring that alignment between the EMA and national payers when it comes to evidence, um, needed evidence. And, and what we see a lot is the EMA is kind of, you know, getting those fast approvals, expedited authorizations, and then, of course, national payers are like, yeah, great, but there's a lot of evidence lacking for us to, to proceed. So how how do you see this moving forward and what do you think are the solutions to solve this issue? Because clearly it's just going to get worse unless, you know, there's, there's a clear roadmap and, and a clear solution. Thank you. So we have another question comment here, another one down there. Any others that I'm missing? There's one more at the front, I think, Natasha, as well. Uh, uh, Tom Dinev with, with Takeda, and I've been involved with stakeholders like FPA, UCOP, on, on some of the solutions that have been put to the table already. And I wanted to, and I put my question also on screen, but I wanted to hear a bit more the perspective of the panel on some of these solutions that already are on the table, uh, such as equity-based tiered pricing, innovative access solutions using reward evidence, and what the thoughts of the panel are about these solutions already on the table. Thank you. Getting a lot of questions. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm coming from left field. I'm Gabriel Orniscom, President Director of the European Society of Organ Transplantation. We have a session next. So two questions, if I may. One, is it time to move to different measures of success? Um, what, should we move beyond what a drug can do in terms of enhancing life? What are the surrogate markers of success? And secondly, we're talking about medicine, but most of the transplantation, for example, my field nowadays relies on technology. How do we in, encompass the same approach of what you've done for, for, the, for the pharma to the uh, ever-developing field of technology in delivery of healthcare? Thank you, and I think when we're talking about advanced therapies, we are increasingly um, not making a distinction. There was a was question the from the lady yeah. here and somewhere else. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Susanna Balkonen, and I'm from the European Federation of Allergy and Airways Diseases uh, Patients Associations. Um, <clears throat> it was really nice to see in the beginning in the in the poll that uh, transparency um, came first. And uh, my question is um, linked to patients. 
how does the panel see that uh, <clears throat> transparency for patients, individual patients who come into healthcare around access to innovation and the care that they need uh, can be improved uh, by this uh, initiative? Because uh, we experience that there are numerous uh, um, inequalities, um, even within uh, countries and regions, and it's impossible for an individual patient to understand what is available and how are their actual needs uh, taken into consideration. And the second uh, <laughs> following uh, from that is that uh, we are slightly concerned about this, um, mm, well, not the notion that patients are at the center and that unmet medical needs are uh, central to the initiatives, but the um, fear that uh, those terms, let's say, might be hijacked by a very different uh, interest. And uh, that's why uh, patients really need to be like really at the center and you can't do it by um by um talking um absolutely I, I think we thank all you share that view. thank you very much for your questions thank you to all of you so i think we close with the questions and sarah back to you and thank the panel you very much natasha um we've got i think five minutes left on this session i can see the countdown so if i go very quickly left to right alexandra any points you want to pick up on there to all those questions Yes, thank you so much. So I will pick up on the point about maximizing benefits and, and um, then making um, these uh, medicines sustainable. So maximizing the benefits of new drugs, it's really about getting those drugs to patients. That's the only way that we will make sure that uh, we really leverage the innovation and, and medicines that come to the market. And then um, balancing budgets. Um, I think, first of all, well, this is a national um, discussion. I think it's, it would be very useful to have a few national uh, stakeholders um, joining this conversation. And um, it's not just health ministries, but finance ministries, industry ministries uh, around the room. And then making them aware that to maybe balance and make the budget more sustainable, there is first um, the need to make an investment, at least in human resources, of building administrative capacity. In my home country, Romania, there are three people negotiating um, uh, with pharmaceutical companies. Yes. So it's really unsustainable uh, yes. with three people to, to be able to advance and make sure that th those are timely and then sustainable discussions. Yeah. So administrative capacity. And, and thank you, yes, just for that. That's very much on our mind um, as we move further east and south um, in the region about the capacity of the um, healthcare systems to undertake this work. Could we bring the Slido results back, the word cloud back, just while we're finishing. Um, that would be great. Francesca, any of those points you want to pick up? Uh, sure, I mean, dif difficult to choose, but just one point because you were mentioning also in relation to um, the question, the issues of value. I think there is a, everybody would agree in principle we need to have value from the spending on medicines, from medicine, but there is a very different interpretation of that, what the value mean. If you ask industry, if you ask, uh, you know, payers, if you ask, uh, uh, governments and and also if you ask ultimately patients. So I think there is probably a little bit more that needs to be done to have a, a convergence because, uh, uh, you know, we, yes, we want to have, make sure that there is access to novel medicine, but there is also a question of are those novel medicine truly innovative and making a difference and how do we measure that value? It's a, it's a really a, an open question and I think it's important to, to have it. Not ultimately because there are areas, I will repeat, areas where we have needs which are unmet, you know, antibiotics, uh, uh, mental health, pain, there is very little innovation there. So we need to think of the uh, different incentive models for, for those areas as well. Great. Thank you, Isabel. Your turn. And Michael, just to let you know, I haven't forgotten you um, online. <laughs> Isabel. Uh, yeah. Begin in the, in the last statement by uh, uh, Francesca. Uh, that that the, we need to find the right balance between the incent incentives uh, for innovation and the need for access to affordable medicines. This is one, one thing that is important. Um, 
we are relying more and more on the on, the, on medicines uh, when uh, when we are 50 years old i think that uh, everybody is taking one two three four uh, different different medicines i am taking four every day so uh, this is something that is important on, on our lives and that is important for 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 the patients um we uh, have a lot of information that is available uh, uh, from from EMA, for example. Uh, but uh, we need to be um, a little bit careful what is really trans transparency for patients. I remember some years ago, and maybe you remember, um, there was a, a proposal that was withdrawn about uh, transparency because in reality it was something like advertising of medicine. So we need to be very careful what uh, what uh, we we want to to offer and what the, the patient need to to know. I don't say that they they have to to have restriction on the information that they they have, but that we need uh, need to be very careful with that. Um, I think that, that that's great. Thank you, Yanis. Yes, um, on the question of uh, uh, Boris, one one qu one uh, word: Aduhelm, the fiasco of Biogen Alzheimer's. In the case of Alzheimer's, it would have cost about 46 billion. So it is useful to distract the conversation and say that it's only 15 percent, or not to focus on a single product. But I remind you of the discussions we've had here. Also, when it came to Sovaldi, uh, member states had to ration. And then with Sovaldi, it kind of worked out well, thanks to competition. Second point, the question on the EMA and payers collaboration. Um, uh, Michael is online. Uh, we have to do much more because my members, the, the payers plus the HDA community, they have a lot of unmet scientific needs, <laughs> a lot of missing information, a lot of missing evidence. So I'm not talking about unmet medical needs. I'm talking about scientific needs. They need, they, they need to have much more in their hands in order to be able to do their job and assess the medicines. And of course, keeping in mind that um, uh, at the point of the marketing authorization, we assess the, the benefit risk ratio, which is very different than the cost effectiveness. And I'll stop here. Thank yes, you very no, much. No, absolutely. Um, and th these are all important questions. Um, shall I bring Michael in there at that point, Simone, if I may, following Yanis's oh, yeah. comments? Michael, sure. over to you. Um, uh, yeah, th thanks, Sarah. And, and yeah, it, it really works quite nicely as a follow up to Yanis's comment, because of course I was going to pick up on, on this question regarding the evidence. Um, and yes, I think there is discussion necessary. I think there is um, a, a range of different perspectives, but I would always uh, refer also back to the experience we have been gaining over the past decade when it comes to working between regulators and HDAs in particular. And I think here we have learned a lot from and about each other. We have learned mm -hmm. how we look at evidence, what our evidence needs, what actually our decision remits and methodologies. And, and we have progressed to, a, to an extent um, which, which is really tremendous. And, and in fact, I would always give credit and also this being eventually even legislation. Um, so uh, as, as Janis was saying, with, with the payer community, we are at an earlier stage. We have had these discussions in previous workshops which we had together. And I think very concretely now, what we have on the table is this workshop I was referring to when it comes to um, real-world evidence uh, generation through Darwin and discussion of use cases, which can be um, potentially useful for different players and stakeholders. I think we really need to work through concrete examples, concrete um, experiences, and from there, we can definitely progress and move the needle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and that's one of our intents as well, is to be that, that concrete and actually very, very practical about what can be implemented and not implemented. Simona, the last word to you before... Oh, thank you. I will abuse for certain <laughs> for the last words, but I will stir, first build upon what Michael said. We need action. I mean, as, as patients, we don't have the time to keep these discussions. Boris, example. On the question on innovation and the innovation cycle, this is, hasn't worked in, in rare diseases necessarily. It has worked on, on freeing up some budget in some country. In England, it was recently reported that the savings done through use of generics allowed for the use of introduction of gene therapy for SMA. Now, there are compounds, biosimilars, in rare diseases that are not produced, on a, uh, uh, not produced because there is no market. Let's bring together a market, pooling demand, and that can be done. One, on the issue around equity tier-based pricing, I don't know, I'll put it here now, but Yanis, we can sit down with, uh, with, with FBI and try to see where can it work equity tier-based pricing. 
what kind of level we can do. Let's put it in, into action. On the unmet need, an unmet need is an unmet need and it is fulfilled. And every disease particularly will remain unmet, uh, uh, they will remain unmet needs until they're fulfilled. Here we are talking though, cures. For the community where 95% uh, of the rare diseases do not have an authorized therapeutic option, not to talk about therapies, uh, this is of real importance. We need to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you to Sarah for excellent moderation. Thank you to our panelists. And thank you to you for having put together the World Cloud. We're going to remember that. I think we have already a successful collaboration in place. The message from Isabel is to keep us all together and to make sure that there is enough equal happiness, equal unhappiness, so that we can continue to keep everybody together. I feel that trust is, is, uh, has come a long way. For those of us who have been in, these, in this room over the years, I look at Boris, I look at Yanis, um, uh, we have started to build trust that didn't exist a number of years ago. And uh, I think the other one that I take then is persistence. Let's persist, but let's also take Simone's um, uh, final words, which is that people can't really wait. So I think we have the formula, and we need to now start putting it into action. Thank you very much for joining us, and please stay tuned, because we will be reaching out through our member states formally as part of our governance process, but as we are always doing as WHO, also reaching out to our NSAs, to our partner industry, as we seek to go forward together. Thank you very much once again for joining, also to people online.